The early 1970s were a time of great turmoil and upset. The free love of the 60s faded to cynicism and growing dangers. For the women of the Pacific Northwest, activities as seemingly harmless as going to the beach or hitchhiking suddenly had deadly consequences. Women began disappearing at a rate never before seen by law enforcement. Tips poured in. Could this handsome, charming law student be their prime suspect? This week's episode is Ted Bundy, Part 2. In the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister who? So I have been thinking since the last time we recorded, you asked me how often I talk to strangers during a week. I realized it's much higher than I originally thought because I've been paying attention all week. And because of Ella, strangers talk to me constantly. Oh, I bet. Oh, she's so cute. How old is she? Yes. Well, also, she loves to smile and say hi and just laugh and flirt with everyone she sees mm-hmm. so it draws a lot of attention to us she's bringing joy to the world oh but unfortunately you have to talk to strangers because <laughs> people of it. stop us to say her smile made my day today <laughs> i mean, I mean like, it's true though it's she when you text me a picture of her it makes my day <laughs> she is so sweet she's now started saying bye a lot that's like her new thing but she says it with a real southern drawl bye. <laughs> she goes bye Bye. She sounds like she's on Designing Women. Oh my God. <laughs> Little Suzanne <laughs> Sugar Baker. That's so good. Bye. Bye, y'all. Bye. She's going to add y'all to it. Bye, y'all. <laughs> but I said, where does she get... I think it's just her inflection because she doesn't quite know how to yeah. say it. I don't think it's yeah. intentional because Tommy and I don't sound like that. Maybe she's watching Designing Women yeah, at night. I'm you like, think she goes if, to sleep. Oh, no. She's up just watching uh, Golden Girls, Designing Women, pretty oh, yeah. much everything I grew up on. Yeah. But what if she has a little baby southern redneck voice? She's going to. <laughs> as children, man, we sure did. There's the did videos. You? Oh, my. The, the video oh, yeah. posted Big a fat shame. baby. You've Tina Butthole Patterson, <laughs> my sister, who does not talk country. No. I mean, now. She sounds like she a got out of it, very yeah. normal, educated person. She does. She don't talk like a. Get, get out of my yard, butthole. I guess just because you talk like that doesn't mean you're not educated. It's true. I have a, a very genius level colleague from law school who's one of the best litigators, trial lawyers ever. And he, I mean, he'll, he'll tell you what. He goes, McKinney. If we could sue somebody for being an asshole, the courthouse would be full up. <laughs> he says stuff like that. Amen. So Amen, brother. Amen. I mean, he's so I good. I would love to just see him in trial. Just oh, yeah. To listen. It's, it'd he's be the one like that, Matthew McConaughey in a time I've, to kill. He's the one that wore gator boots to school, and the, the guy that was teaching us how to talk to jury said, uh, don't wear boots like that because, you know, people may think that you're putting on a show. And my friend goes, well, all right, I'll take that into consideration. And the guy goes, well, if you talk like that, then. <laughs> wear those boots yes <laughs> well this is how i talk <laughs> asshole and he goes all right well i'm gonna keep them then <laughs> what are gator boots they're like uh, cowboy, boots, cowboy boots that are made out of gator skin that oh. are real shiny black beautiful gator always boots. wear those gator boots and a pimped out gucci suit it's a song christy <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> oh, sorry it Get sounds it. like a classic they actually teach you that's how you dress in law school they sing that song to you no <laughs> uh, i talked to a stranger i was at a bar last night and i was taking a selfie with my friends and i injured myself Taking a selfie, which is a very, someone said today, a very Heather injury. How did you injure yourself? I, I was did trying you drop to, your phone on your face? No, it's all about angles when you're taking a good selfie. And I twisted my neck the wrong way oh, so I could get a good angle. That's, you know what? Sometimes I'll just turn and watching TV wrong and throw yeah. my back out. It's awful. Yeah. It's awful. But the guy behind the bar then started laughing and started talking to us. And we were talking about guys and stuff. And he was like, no, you know, he was getting into our conversation. And we're like, that's fun. But no, thank you. <laughs> Go back to serving drinks, sir. <laughs> Which is fine. If, if like today, I had a really great rapport with my six divine server. We like commiserated about this table of the word margarita mamas. You taught me. Mm-hmm. There were some margarita mamas at this table that caused my lunch to be delayed, and the oh. server was just like, "I'm so sorry." And I said, "You're dealing with those margarita mamas." She laughed so hard, and then we commiserated about being servers. But this guy was like, "We're clearly having a." girl talk kind of private and he was sort of inserting himself and you know it just makes you wonder if someone starts 
putting themselves in your conversation, asking you for favors. If maybe they're Ted Bundy. Probably a murderer. If maybe they've got... 100% a serial maybe killer. Maybe they took the passenger seat out of their car <laughs> so they can just slide you in. Yeah. Yeah. That is such a creepy, just maniacal planning. Premeditated. Yes. To, yeah. to be... To have the forethought of... I'm going to plan this out so much and know how this is going to happen that I'm going to take the passenger seat out of my car. Well, and it's hard. I would think it would be hard to shove a lifeless body, an unconscious body into the back seat of the Beetle because you'd have to push the seat forward. And then if you put her in the front seat and strap them in with the seatbelt, their head would be long yeah. back and forth. And that would sort of cause yeah. a scene. So it's just this like forethought of, I know what I, I know how and to get away with it. Plan- he thought of all those possibilities. Mm-hmm. That's so crazy. Yeah. And it, the fun, I, another hot take. First episode, my hot take was Ted Bunny's a shitbag. Yeah. Second hot take, he was not an evil genius. I think that he was determined. Yes. To, to get the results that he wanted in rage field and, uh, you know, this male, like I said, this bruised, fragile mm-hmm. male ego or whatever. But I, he was, a mean, his LSAT scores weren't great. No. Which, as a person who had mediocre LSAT scores and nevertheless is a competent and you lawyer. you went to the Harvard of the South. I went to the so. Harvard of the South. But it, that doesn't necessarily mean it. But he, they said he struggled so hard through first year law classes and really didn't. He, I think his whole entire life was this like slick bullshit bravado. Yeah, for sure. That people It was go, a show. Ted Bundy was a genius serial killer. Ted Bundy was a guy who said everyone in the 70s is pretty trusting. I'm just going to start snatching people up. He's not, he's a serial killer and that a person walking down an alleyway and sees a garage open, steals all the stuff out of it is some sort of mastermind, you know? I mean, I just don't think he was this great genius that ever, I think in his later life interviews, he wanted people to think that. And he wanted to build this persona, like we said, up. And when someone sticks a microphone in you, you tell your own story, right? You're right. But I, I would like to disabuse everyone of this notion that he was some kind of, I think he took, he saw open... An you, open door. An open door and just took... It's like football. You know, they like... You see it, grab the ball and run. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're the best football player because ever. Because he... Other, apart from his victims kind of looking the same, yeah. which everyone in the 70s had long, dark hair. They parted down the middle. My mother did. Were Cher. Thin. My mom did too. Yeah. I have this theory that everyone in, in the 70s, you just... They just were all like gorgeous model. <laughs> like, I guess True. it's not... Like everyone was rail thin. Yeah, you never see footage from back then of just a bunch of lard asses walking around the beach. It's always <laughs> like these hot people. I don't understand. Seventies what, were what very happened? Rude against fat people. <laughs> yes, Maybe everyone not. was so small. The clothes were so tiny. True. I so everyone looked the same. I bet food was different back then too. Yeah, and people were just smaller. I mean, and also when we were. I mean, people get bigger with each decade. If, if Wally is to tell, tell us anything, I've never that's seen true. it because I know it'll be too sad. If, if you watch the trailer for Wally, you'll lose it. Don't oh, I, I yeah, have, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think that in the seventies, they maybe walked around more, hiked more. There was less. Now we have computers that keep us yeah, on our asses. Very true. Our job keeps us on our asses. Our phones keep us on our asses. So you know, in the seventies, you go for a hike for fun, walk around the park with your kids, whatever. So yeah, probably a lot more. But active. he, apart from that. It was just who's available. Yeah. It was whoever would talk to him. Everybody, wrong place, wrong time. If something didn't work out, I mean, he was nothing if not tenacious. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he'd go to a place and first person wouldn't help him. Cool. I'm going to try 10 more girls. Uh, Unfortunately for that woman, she She said, sure, I'll help you out. And that was the last anybody Mm -hmm. heard from her. It was all just wrong place, wrong time. And he he was an opportunity hunter. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I think saying, well, he had a type in the 70s. They had long, dark hair parted down the middle would be like if a serial killer in the 90s was always abducting women with like fringe uh, framed yeah. faces like Rachel Everyone's haircuts. like they all had the Jennifer Aniston yeah, haircut. Yeah, the Rachel. Yeah, so did. I mean, that's everybody, did. everybody did in the I 90s. Sure did. I did too. Or in the early 2000s, I had that really dope bleach blonde hair with the black streaks like I Christina Aguilera. I never did Aguil- that. I never like did Christina that. Christina Aguilera. I, I, I was already in college by the time Oh, that, I clung to my streaks for far too long. <laughs> I've never had one. Once I tried to do a blue streak in college, and mm-hmm. it did not go well. I had purple underneath, and it was gorgeous. I loved it. I would do that again. I've I tried in high school to dye my hair red, 
And I just look like Carrot Top. Oh, and all throughout high school, I was redhead. And it looked like natural red hair. And there were four of us with red hair. Two naturals, two dyed. And we called ourselves the Redhead Moped Club. And we were so (laughs) cool. Did you drive mopeds? Nope. It was just the name. And we had (laughs) matching t-shirts that I made on the computer and ironed on shirts. And we would wear them to school. And one looked like a Harley logo. For some reason, one looked like the MasterCard logo. The two women I was taking the selfie with that injured myself last night were two of the three members. And the fourth member also listened. Emily in Nashville was our fourth. uh, Well, Emily. Emily and Jessica's hair grows out of their head that way. Leanne and I have gone natural to our brunettes. Oh. So See, I've pretty much always stayed blonde. Yeah. Well. So you'd be safe in the same I would. No, he wouldn't have wanted. Well, we already discussed last time. I would have been too much for him to handle. <laughs> <laughs> and I had the wrong hair color. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. I'm the blonde one. I'm the brunette. And today we are going to be talking about the second part of Ted Bundy. The first episode, if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it. We talk all about his childhood, his teenage and college years, pretty much everything leading up to when the attacks began, which is what we're going to be discussing in today's episode. Also, just a heads up, it's women living their lives, meeting violent ends. Yeah. So if that's not your thing, totally understand. Spoiler alert, every person we say, Heather was a nice lawyer and was 30 years old, 30 whatever years old. By the end of that paragraph, it's not going to go well. No, no. Uh, Two of them don't die. Correct. But it's still fucked up. It's horrifying. Most of them do die. Yeah. And we're not even... Some of the victims we're actually going to be discussing in the third episode because it was just too too much murder. Yeah, there's too many. Too many. He... This dude killed a lot of innocent women. He had a lot of opportunity. So, all right. Well, let's get into it. To this day, it remains unclear... When Ted Bundy's killing spree began, he told some that he first attempted to kidnap a woman in 1969 in New Jersey, but that he didn't escalate to killing until 1971 in Seattle. However, he told psychologist Art Norman that he did, in fact, murder two women in 1969 in Atlantic City. It's a lot of issues of him, however he's feeling. That's the story he tells. Very much so. While Bundy strongly hinted to homicide detectives that he killed several women in 1973 and 1974, he never actually confessed. Detective Robert Keppel believes Bundy actually started killing when he was just 14 years old and that his first victim was 8-year-old Anne Marie Burr of Tacoma, Washington. Despite circumstantial evidence linking Bundy to this crime, he always maintained he didn't do it. Did you read Mother Burr's letter to Ted Bundy? Oh, gosh, It was no. so sad. It was when he was on death row and finally convicted, and she wrote him a letter that said, please, Oh, yes, just please admit tell me. to doing this yeah. so I can just have some And he closure. wouldn't. He yeah. wrote her back and just, he never did. But even in the letter, he it's said a, some things that clearly he knew what had happened I think and he so. did it. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's just. It's control. It's a matter of control and power. He's going to tell the story he wants to tell. He's not going to be coerced into admitting anything he doesn't want to. And he also wanted to maintain this image that nothing in his childhood made him the person he was. And I think that it was not the, the case. I think yes. he had a lot of identity issues with not having his name changed so many times. And then the mom, no clear identity of who your parentage is yes. and issues with that and wanting to seize something that makes you you. So I think that also makes sense. Also seeing his grandfather, whom he admired, being extremely abusive. And violent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he grew up in an abusive, confusing family And I think that kind of started the whole thing. Yeah. Well, the earliest documented homicides committed by Bundy took place in 1974 when he was 27 years old. On January 4th, 1974, also my birthday. What? Not 74, but January 4th, which was right around the time Bundy ended things with Stephanie Brooks. He broke into the apartment of University of Washington student Karen Sparks also sometimes referred to as Joni Lenz, Mary Adams, or Terry Caldwell. I think in a lot of cases when there were early reports on a lot of this stuff, especially if the victims were alive, they always use pseudonyms. Yes, so they're trying couple, to protect them for couple sure. couple of different names. And yeah, he he and Stephanie in things, he's reeling. He's pissed off. Pissed and off. And he's looking to take some anger out on Because she basically somebody. told him he was a big old loser. Yeah. Well, this was when he ended it with her after that long. Oh, con. that's right. Oh, yeah. after his. That's so right. the he trap. was planning the trap. He gaslighted her yes. into think into forgetting that they were ever engaged. She said, "I don't know what you're talking." If you haven't listened yeah. to part one, yes, go. He tricked her into thinking they were engaged insane. and bailed. Well, as Karen lay sleeping in her bed, Ted brutally attacked her with a metal rod, 
He then sexually assaulted her using that same rod. The beating Karen endured was so severe that she was left in a coma for 10 days following the attack. While she did manage to survive, she was left with permanent disabilities, both physical and mental, and has no memory of the attack, which I guess is a blessing in disguise. It's true. That is one of my worst fears is waking up and someone being standing over me in my bedroom. Seriously. I, I like to think I would fight. But I think you would be so stunned and not understand what was happening that you would kind of just freeze. Yeah. Or if he, in a lot of cases, they think he hit them before they woke yeah, up. Yeah. She so was had, just asleep and had got no chance. knocked unconscious before she could even do anything. Well, that's why I sleep sandwiched between two dogs and one of them is a 70 pound pit bull. <laughs> yes. I, <laughs> Kate will, our pit bull lets us know if anybody comes within a hundred yards of the house. So that is, I'm always very thankful that if someone did break in here, well, first of all, we have an alarm, but if something happened with that, she would lose her mind and hopefully scare them off. Yeah. Well, less than a month later on February 1st, Bundy attacked another university of Washington student in the early morning hours. Bundy broke into the basement apartment of Linda Ann Healy and beat her unconscious. In the morning, her roommates went to look for her and noticed the side door which led to the basement was unlocked. They called her employer to see if she had made it into work. And when Linda's boss reported that she wasn't there, the roommates became increasingly worried. I think they had hit a key as well. And that may have been the way he got in. That The door wasn't like kicked mm, in or anything. That's but, the 70s, man. You know, or they said, well, the, you know, the locks. Or kinda, just left it unlocked. The lock's kind of yeah. finicky. Just leave it unlocked. Yeah. And she was a, she did the ski reports on the, yes. yeah, mm-hmm. on the radio. Yeah. So, yeah, they said, well, maybe she went to work early and then called and yeah. she wasn't there. They noticed that her bed was made. Although they said it looked different than how Linda usually made it. Her room was immaculately clean and her bike was at home. No one saw her at class all day. And when her family came over that night for dinner and Linda never showed up, they called the police and reported her missing. Yeah, it was super sad, coincidental timing that her family was planning to come over for dinner anyhow. Yeah. When the police arrived and pulled back the bedspread, they saw a blood stain on Linda's sheets and pillow. Police also found a bloody nightgown on the floor. Her clothes from the day before were also missing, as well as her backpack and another pillowcase. Based on the scene, the police believed Linda had been beaten in her sleep and removed from the house. Later that afternoon, the roommates received three suspicious phone calls where they all heard on the other end of the line heavy breathing. An unidentified male also called the police and told them that Linda's abduction and the Karen Sparks attack were related. You think it was Bundy? I wonder. I th- I think so. Why else? Yeah, who else would call? It's interesting. So early on in his spree, he would do something. It's power and control. I think yeah. he thought, I'm smarter than them. I'm better than them. I'll even call them and tell and, them. And I think all serial killers like that degree of excitement mm-hmm. of possibly being caught. That's why. And then for a lot of them, it just becomes so stressful that they haven't been caught. That's yeah. when they, they start to do, do things lash to out. intentionally get caught. Yeah. Linda's remains would later be found at Taylor Mountain, a place where Ted would go on to leave multiple victims. From January to June of 1974, female college students were disappearing at an alarming rate of one per month. On March 12th, Donna Manson left her dorm at the Evergreen State College in Olympia to attend a jazz concert on campus. She never arrived, and her remains were never found. Years later, Ted would confess to burning Donna's head in the fireplace of Liz Klepfer's home, his girlfriend at the time. He was pretty shitty. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it, yeah, he's a shitbag. Yeah. Well, he's a shitbag. You know, I mean, it's horrifying what he, as far as the murders he committed, but then so invasive of Liz's house where her daughter slept yeah. to bring the victim's severed head and then burn it in the fireplace. Just to cut someone's head off is a lot of work. It's a lot of work, and you got to have a lot of anger in you to be able to Saw all the way through. do that and to stomach it. And this was pattern that developed with all of his victims he had so much pent-up rage inside of him that he was able to control Mm -hmm. in normal day-to-day situations i mean he lived a normal life at work and with his girlfriend and things like that it's just so scary to think how i mean 
Anne Rule's book is perfectly titled The Stranger Beside Me. Do you really ever know someone? You know what I mean? Like it's true. you could go you could be working with someone for 10 years mm-hmm. and then you find out they murdered their whole family. <laughs> you know. And well, and I think back then too the signs of kind of a psychopath weren't as well known by the yeah. general populace and mental I think, health wasn't at the forefront that no. it might be today and he had a lot of early ish signs of being a psychopath as far as the charmingness and remembering small details about mm-hmm. people and a little bit lack of empathy and remorse for others yeah and so i think now hopefully we would somewhat google is my boss a psychopath or <laughs> is my co-worker a psych- or whatever I my google, neighbor every time i meet someone new i plug their name in <laughs> I just put plus psychopath and see if anything comes up. Please tell me Google. (laughs) On April 17th, Susan Rancourt, a student in Central Washington State College, disappeared from the town of Ellensburg, 110 miles east-southeast of Seattle. Susan was a shy girl who worked a full-time job at a nursing home to pay her way through college and was reportedly scared of many things, including the dark. I relate. On a deep spiritual level, I just confessed to Christy I couldn't sleep last night because I shut my eyes to go to sleep. And halfway between sleep and awake, I thought about the clown from It. But what did I say? I said, I can't believe this because last night I was trying to go to sleep and thought about the new trailer for It and also got real panicky and couldn't and couldn't fall asleep. I had to wake up and turn on the office. I didn't do that because... I would wake up Tommy. That's true. But you... you... I just lay there with uh, crippling anxiety and <laughs> thoughts racing through my mind for hours on end till I finally fall asleep. Yeah, I'm banned from watching that trailer anymore. It's too scary. It is. I mean, it scares me, and I don't get scared easily. I can't believe you watched it. Honestly, <laughs> I, didn't mean to. I, I you should the... have told... That's on me. I should have said... Heather, do not watch well, this trailer. A, a teaser popped up on Facebook, and that scared me enough. And then I told someone about it, and then we were at the movies. And when the trailer started, he actually was kind enough to lean over and say, it's the It trailer. Brace yourself. Because at first, <laughs> it's, so it kind of does come on, unless you know who the actors are. No, I didn't. You don't really know what's happening at first. And the first five minutes of that trailer with the old woman. It's so scary. But, then, but it's going to be so good. Well, then Bill Hader pops Bill up. Bill Hader's in it. Jessica Chastain. There's a, it's a great cast. I will I'm watch anything with Bill Hader. Do you watch him. Barry? I am very behind on this season, but I've watched every other episode. Man, two episodes ago, I think it was either two or three episodes ago, was one of the best episodes of television I've I need ever a binge. Seen. I need a binge, so Barry. Good. Catch oh, up. It's really good. This season's great. Well, the night of April 17th, Susan Rancourt, the five foot two young woman, set off across campus with an armful of clothes. She stopped at the school laundry room and loaded them in a washing machine, then walked to an informational meeting on campus. She was planning to meet a friend to watch a German film after the meeting. When she didn't show up for the movie, never collected her clothes, and then failed to show up for a final exam the next day, her friends became suspicious and called the police. This is another thing I was thinking about in terms of these issues is now I have find my friend, so Leanne, my wife yeah. can find me all the time. My mom, my sister, you know, we all look at, look out for each other. And you and I have talked about this, like how many hours it would mm-hmm. have to be for us to say, be concerned, genuinely yeah. concerned. But back then she said, Hey, I'll meet you guys at this movie yeah. and There's goes no and does laundry, phones. goes to a movie or goes to the informational meeting. And her friends just think when she doesn't show up to a movie, she must've changed her mind. Yeah. You don't have a cell phone. Mm-hmm. You can't tell if somebody's been posting on Instagram True. or Facebook. Uh-huh. It's just up to, if there was a lot you of run into somebody that saw feeling. somebody yeah yeah a lot of going well she's probably fine and again it's the 70s it's all everyone's you know free spirits it's also in the pacific northwest where it's even like more of a hippie type lifestyle yeah. so it's a more laid back thing you might not think anything of it yeah until it you was, don't show up for class and s- things like that. Once it's been a while. Oh, yeah. I mean, and this was unprecedented amounts of abductions and murders at yeah. the time. I think the year before they had had 11 murders and nine were solved. And the year before that, they had five murders and all five were solved. So, in a year. In a year. Yeah. So this all has of a sudden, been six months. All of a sudden, it's just two a month, four a month. That's and crazy. It's, they can't even keep up. Yeah. Upon looking at the path Susan would have walked, police were particularly concerned with the dark railway trestle she would have had to walk underneath to get home. However, her friends reminded police that abducting her would not be easy. She had studied karate and would be one to fight. I hope that I would be one. I know I would fight. 
Oh, yeah, I, would, I think so. Especially now. I mean, I would have always fought, but now, like, I think all I would think of is I got to get home yeah. to Ella. That's true. It would, would make just, you... It would. It, you get that mom strength. Mm-hmm. Like, when you can lift a car off of, you know, a, a baby or something yeah. that's stuck underneath. Where you say, I can get out no matter what. Yeah. I'm from Mesquite, so I fight dirty, so... <laughs> You're scrappy. I'll, be pulling, so I'll pull somebody's hair out. <laughs> but I think the problem with Ted Bundy is that he wouldn't... He wasn't taking these women by force. He was yes. talking with them, getting them just vulnerable enough for them to turn their back mm-hmm. for them, him to hit yes. him in the head. Yeah. So I think in none of these cases, oh, if he she was just... was a pussy. Oh, he was a huge pussy. Well, if she just would have fought harder. She, yeah. No, 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 no. This was all... He was luring them very effectively. Mm-hmm. And then it's just the one split second where you turn your yep. back. That's when... That's why I never turn my back <laughs> You on look anyone. someone in the eyes. You never break Forever. eye contact. <laughs> That's why I've been asked not to return to that Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you have to walk backwards out of every room yes, you're in for break eye contact. I live a paranoid life. Well, as days went by and there was still no trace of Susan, other co-eds began to come forward to report meeting a man with an injured arm plastered in a cask, asking them for favors. The woman described the stranger as tall and handsome. And that he said he hurt his arm in a skiing accident. And Rule discusses being in the... She was a reporter, so the woman who wrote A Stranger Beside Me, who was his co-worker mm-hmm. and then biographer. She describes being in the room with these police from various jurisdictions coming together to sort of trade information and try to figure out what, ha- what how this could have happened. Mm-hmm. And they had a list of... Pot before some of the witnesses came forward, a list of what would cause a, a woman to willingly go with someone. Mm-hmm. And the police said if they presented as official, so if police, fire, EMT, if they presented as a priest, mm, or if they presented as someone who was in need of help or handicapped. Yep. And you're, you're preying on their sympathetic and he nature. he was a psych major. Yeah. So he knew oh, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He knew this. Yeah, and he studied the law. Like, he, he mm-hmm. as far as the worst things he could have studied to know how to get away with stuff like this he pretty much covered all his bases i think so he should have gone to culinary school yeah or ba- bake a delicious Who knows cake. what he could have been he could have, he could have had a better <laughs> life but no yeah. well bundy would ask the women to help him carry books or a package to his car once at the car he then asked them to slide in to try and start it when both women noticed that the front passenger seat of his vw beetle was removed they became suspicious and fled. Well, thank God. I think Beetle did a good job rebranding in the <laughs> 90s by making it a Barbie car. <laughs> yeah, and putting the little <laughs> flower holder yes. vase. I love that in, in little Beetles. They're like, we're a Barbie car now, not a Ted Bundy car. Stop saying that we're a Ted Bundy car. Susan's remains were also later found at Taylor Mountain, the same place where Linda Ann Healy's had been discovered months earlier. So he had car- sort of created this pattern for himself where... Do the luring. Yeah. He do, liked the ritual the of ritual, it. The ritual, doing his thing. And then that's his, he knows it's a good place to go. He the also, animals would take care of the meat oh, yeah. part. Yeah. In the Ted Bundy tapes, Confessions with the Killer on Netflix. So Stephen McCod and Ainsworth, Hugh Ainsworth, I believe is his name, are the interviewers. And in the beginning, McCod was having a lot of trouble getting Bundy to really fess up to anything or to, to yeah. talk about anything. Until he had the idea to ask Bundy to talk about everything in third person. Genius. And he played to his ego mm-hmm. of saying... If you were going to do it. You, you're a lawyer. You've studied law. You've studied psychology. You know a lot about what would motivate someone to be... Let's, you know their you're psyche. Genius. Yeah, you're a genius. So talk to us about the type of person that might do this. And immediately, <laughs> he said, Bundy took the tape recorder out of his hand, just sat back in his chair. Went to town. And he, it was like I wasn't even there anymore. He just, and that's all, all he wanted was literally a microphone to brag about these stories, but he wanted to do it in a way where he could still not necessarily maintain innocence, but not come oh. right out. Like the OJ thing. OJ did the same thing. If with I did his it. Book. If I did it. Oh, that yeah. interview with OJ is so awkward. Oh, well, he yeah. talks about basically that he did yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is he's talking about it in third person. Or hypothetical. Yeah. I wonder, and I'd love to hear your take, why do you think that Ted Bundy was so emphatic that he was innocent up, up until the, the end? He eventually came clean towards a couple months before execution or a month before execution. Mm-hmm. But he was so vehemently insistent that he was innocent. Do you think it was his ego because he didn't want to seem like a monster? Do you think he didn't want to hurt his mom? 
I definitely don't think it was about his mom. Yeah. I think it was arrogance. I think yeah. he thought he was smarter than the system. That's when we get into the trial stuff, when he decides to represent himself. <laughs> everyone else around him is just a BFI. He's the only one that can... He slaps on that bow tie and suddenly <laughs> he thinks he's been taking smart pills. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it was all arrogance and power. And that's true. If he maintained his innocence, he would be able to still appeal. Yeah, and I because think... Because when you plead guilty, you give up your right to appeal mm-hmm. on anything except for ineffective assistance of counsel and maybe one other thing, depending on the jurisdiction. But I think you're he right. He was that makes so sense. adamant, though, that he was innocent. I think he thought I he was I wonder if he... It, you know how if you lie enough to yourself, you eventually start to believe it? George Costanza, if you, yeah. if you, if you believe it yourself, it's not a lie anymore. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, obviously, I, th- I think he full well knew that he was guilty. Yeah. But I think he thought... I can convince the world that I'm not Mm -hmm. because I'm that smart. That would be the great arrogant caper that he could pull off of not only, well, first of all, if he had never gotten caught, I think he would have been more satisfied with himself. But there's just that ego cat and mouse. He won. It's a game Mm -hmm. to him. And then, oh, you arrested me? Watch me get out. Oh, you arrested me? Watch me get off. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. What is that? What do you think? No, now that you say that, it makes sense. I was just trying to reconcile. I, I I thought it was ego, but not so much as he was trying to get away with it. But now I do think that. I thought I just thought he just didn't want to be perceived by the public as some sort of monster. That might be part of it, too. That it's, yeah, that he wants to be thought of as some legal genius, which he wasn't. No, not Because he represented all. himself. Also, who wants to spend the rest of their life in jail? True. He, <laughs> if he can convince everyone he didn't do it, then he can still stay out and murder people. True, true. But it was really interesting on the Confessions with the Killer how much he's willing to open up once mm-hmm. he starts talking about it in third person. It's a hypothetical situation. Yeah. Suddenly, whenever the culpability is sort of released, when he can not say, I'm doing it, but right. if a person was doing it, right. yeah, suddenly the floodgates oh, open. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he, much like OJ did, divulged everything. It's, it I, I would recommend watching them. I'm still, I haven't made my way through all of it, but. I finished watching them. I'd fall asleep through the second one. I fell asleep one. in the second one, too. And then I woke up and rewatched them all, and I had some very strange dreams, so don't I, do that. I fell asleep in the second one, had to go back and rewatch some stuff as well. Watch it when you have had a full cup of coffee and a good Yeah, it sleep. wasn't because it was boring. It's because I didn't feel well, and I am always tired. I'm, I, what is it? That's my secret cap. I could always go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. I'm always sleepy. Well, pretending to be injured and needing help was Bundy's M.O. He would wear a cast on his arm or leg and ask young women for help putting books or other objects in the trunk of his tan VW Beetle. He preyed on the sympathetic nature of these young women. And then, while they were at their most vulnerable helping him, he would hit them over the head with a pipe or crowbar, stunning them or knocking them unconscious. Bundy would then handcuff them and force them into his car. To aid in his process, Bundy had removed the passenger seat so he could force his victim to lie down, remaining out of sight as he drove away. So he had a whole, he had a whole thing, routine, whole thing going. Roberta Kathleen Kathy Parks was another woman who fell victim to Bundy's monstrous ways. Kathy disappeared from her school's campus on May 6, 1974. She was last seen leaving her dormitory on her way to a coffee date with friends. She never arrived. And later, the grisly discovery of her remains were also found on Taylor Mountain. So again, somebody who has actually has people waiting for them, but no way to contact them. And back in the 70s, benefit of the doubt. If you were waiting for friend a friend and they didn't show up and you couldn't get a hold of them, would you immediately assume the worst? I wouldn't immediately assume the worst. I would probably go, in this case... If they lived on campus and she had a dorm, I would go to the dorm. Mm -hmm. I would talk to the RA. I'm just that kind of person, though, that my grandmother, I love my mamma, which is my mom's mom, would watch the news in the morning. My dad, for most of his career, was an independent contractor with the Dallas Morning News. So meaning he would go get the newspapers where they were printed and then go and take them around to stores and stuff. Mm -hmm. My, what a job that doesn't exist anymore. (laughs) Yeah. Really. I mean, few and far between. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, he drove a white van with Mm -hmm. no windows on the side. He would fill it. He would fill it. We had always had a a murderer van in front of our house. (laughs) It was great for keeping kids away. Yeah. Uh, He would drive his van out to the newspaper place, pick up the newspapers and go home. Well, he'd usually be home by six or so in the morning. My grandmother 
mother every day would watch the news. And if there was a car accident on the drive time news Mm -hmm. that involved a van like that, Mm -hmm. she would have to call the house and say, is Phil home? Is he home? And she just had to know. (laughs) Yes. And so that has been passed down and passed down to where my mom, I know, I love you, mother. I know she checks my find a friend multiple times throughout the day. Because she's got to know. It makes her feel better. Yes. It makes her feel better. If I if Ella had a phone, I'd have a find a friend all the time. Be like, where are you? I in the just, living room? You're not in here with me right now. Where'd you wander off to? <laughs> you, you you where'd you go? In the you kitchen? Do you want a snack? I, I think even in the seventy, I mean, just having the family I had. Now I would do the same if I can't get a hold of Leanne, my wife. Very concerned, but I, we have find our friends on our phone, so I can see if she's at her house, at a friend's house, at work, or whatever. And can you turn it off so people can't you could, find you? You can uh, choose who you share it with. If you turn it on airplane mode, it can't track you. It would just track. So, like, say I'm at work, I turn my phone on airplane mode, and then, or I unshared my location with someone. That would be the last place they would see me. Would be work, mm. and then I could go off and do whatever I wanted, and then go back. And then once I turn airplane mode back off, then it would pop up my location. I'm a private person. Yeah. I don't, I mean, most people know where I am all the time because it's one of three places. Target, my living room, or Dallas Comedy House. That's pretty much the same. (laughs) If I'm not there, I probably, I'm probably dead. I'm like homework DCH pretty much consistently. But I. Or I post a bunch of stories to Instagram so anybody can see. Like Chrissy's at the New Kids on the Block concert. (laughs) Or Chrissy's at North Park Mall. True. Yeah. Everyone can see where I am. So that, yeah, if I could turn it off, I would do that. But I am the type that uh, immediately assumes the worst. If you and I were supposed to meet at a Starbucks for coffee and I said, I will be there at 430, 4, 435, 440, 450. And I couldn't get a hold of you. And you couldn't get a hold of me. I would start to get worried. And like message my mom. I or probably my, would. Yeah. yeah, I definitely would. Especially, well, I would probably first come to your house because my True. first thought would be she fell asleep. <laughs> And then, and then if I couldn't, if you weren't here, then I would message your mom. Yeah. Same. I would message Tommy. Because the first 48 hours are the most crucial. <laughs> if the first 48 has taught us anything, the first 48 we is got the most a, We got the, the quicker we get to the Such bottom of it, the, the more likely you are to survive. Such a good show. It really is. Well, police were beginning to believe they had a pattern on their hands. The high number of abductions and murders was well beyond the two to four murders per year to which the area was accustomed. One thing the officers noticed was the similarities among the victims. They were all young, white, brunette, college-aged students that wore their hair parted down the middle. However, regarding the perpetrator, there was little physical evidence to go on and only a vague description. A medium-height, handsome man with dark hair and a broken arm and a Volkswagen Beetle. Unfortunately, there were approximately 42,000 VW Beetles rolling around Washington State during this time. And I was thinking, too, even though the, you know you have the DMV back then, I don't know that they would have a centralized, digitized, mm-hmm. searchable vehicle registry that you would have now. If someone said a silver Honda Civic that looked older, a silver or older model Honda Civic mm-hmm. ran over somebody, you would be able to narrow it down yeah. in the Dallas area. Honda, And obviously po- the police came and talked to our uh, office just about sort of general crime in and around the office. And he said, if you could even get a one letter from a license plate, you're a hero. He wow. said, I know if something's going on, you're overwhelmed. Please, please, if you just say it ends with an X, I can tell you the license plate ends That's with huge. an X. That's so helpful because now they have this centralized Texas you know, Department of mm-hmm. Public Safety database. But I bet you back then, all of it was decentralized and it had each individual county yeah. did their car registry. So you can't sit there and call every single county in the state of Washington and say, right. can you send us all the Beatles? Yeah, no. I'm telling you, I, I've said it before, it was pretty easy to get away with murder. But as I said, that's why I don't think he's some sort of, you know, no. in he could He would have killed one person and been caught within hours in today's society. Yeah. yeah. But he did know how not to leave DNA mm-hmm. and, and evidence behind. But also, their DNA capabilities were so minimal compared to what we have now that you, you couldn't do all this stuff. And we'll get that into that in the trial part, too, yeah. of kind of what uh, the cutting edge things that they used for him. While police desperately searched for any clues as to who this monster terrorizing the Pacific Northwest might be, the body count continued to rise. Brenda Carol Ball was last seen speaking to an attractive man wearing a cast on his arm outside of a bar in Tacoma on June 6, 1974. Just like the other victims, her skull was later found on Taylor Mountain. 
Georgiane Hawkins was nervous for her impending Spanish exam on the night of June 11, 1974. She slipped out of her sorority house and headed to the fraternity house 90 feet away where her boyfriend lived. After visiting with him for about a half an hour, she headed home around midnight on the short walk back to her home. That's 90 feet. That's, that's so close. It's. This is the type of parent I will be. I <laughs> Talk on the phone the whole time. Yeah. But I'm you serious. But I don't, I mean, it's a whole, I, it's a whole frat house full of guys. Not one of them could have fucking walked her home. Dude, that's what I'm saying. As Georgianne left the frat house, one of her boyfriend's frat brothers leaned out the window and yelled down at her. She looked up and chatted with him from the window for a few minutes about her Spanish exam. She then left and headed down the alley. But also, you think it's just 90 feet. She's got to go walk two houses down. I don't need to walk you, huh? I mean, how many times at DCH, because we always say, walk with someone to your car, because there's a lot of stuff that goes on in Deep Ellum. And if you're just parked, you know, a block over. It's fine. I'll be fine. Yeah. And it usually is, but... Sometimes it's not. It's not. And also this street was well known of being incredibly safe. It had all the Greek houses on mm-hmm. it. And there were pools of light. She mm-hmm. was going in the alleyway kind of behind the houses. But nevertheless, it would be like in Dallas if yeah. someone was walking on the SMU campus. Yeah. You just assume there's patrol. It's well lit. There's a bunch of students up. They're all still your awake. down because you're in your territory. And, and she's focused place. on you know, thinking about her test. Yeah. Not really. Yeah. But he knows this too. Yeah. He's been hunting this area to see, oh, where can I hide? That people just it won't be well lit, and somebody might be walking by. She just walks on, walks yeah. on by. Two other frat brothers claim to have seen her walk about forty more feet, meaning she would have been only forty feet from the back door of her sorority house when she was abducted. You, she, she could see it. She could see where the porch light on. She could see how to get home. Fuck that shit. That gets to me. It's heartbreaking. Georgiane had lost her key, so she had an agreement with her roommate that she would toss small pebbles at their shared window so Georgiane could be let in. After hours passed and the roommate heard no sound of pebbles, she went and woke the house mother to alert her of the situation. Were you in a sorority? No. Nor was I. But I rushed for about two days and then said, this is not for me. <laughs> and I dropped and I went and partied instead, <laughs> which you were not allowed to do if you were rushing. Oh, there you go. So yeah. there was, a, you had an incentive. Yeah, kind of. Yes. Yeah. I was, I went to the informational meeting and they said, we don't have any fra- uh, sorority houses for you to live in. This was at Loyola, New Orleans. They said, but it'll be $8,000 for you to join. And I just thought, fuck you. <laughs> what do you get for $8,000? You get a lot of parties. A lot I, of mixers. I still went to the parties. I've I've taken yeah, a shot a from an too. ice luge at a frat too, house several times. But I think if I could have lived on, if I could have lived in a sorority house or something, that may have been uh, more incentive mm, for me to join. I, when I rushed, I wasn't even with the intention to live in the house. I'm not even sure as a freshman if you could. And the freshman, we had to live in the dorm, but yeah. then ab- subsequently after that, oh uh, yeah, could, I yeah. was already in the dorms and had my room and roommate and everything when this was going on. So. It's b- part of the reason why I don't go to church, part of the reason why I didn't join a sorority, you got to be nice to everybody. Yeah. And I don't want to be friends with everybody. I'm not a, I'm not a sorority girl. I don't want to be friends with everybody. No. I want to be friends with who I want to be friends yeah. with and shun the people I don't. Yes. Well, that's a different type of sorority. What's shunning? No, just that the type you just described. Oh, I got to find that one. <laughs> well, I so, think you think my sorority window has closed. I think it's in Mean Girls. That's kind of their sorority, <laughs> isn't it? Regina, what is it? Re- the Regina George. Regina George's sorority. Yeah. No, I don't think your window's closed. Dare to dream. <laughs> you want us? I'll join your sorority. Let's start our own sorority. It's, okay. I think we have. I, I think, think with the show. I think, it's, I think podcaster than a sorority. <laughs> honestly, true. I think we have. Everyone's I've, welcome. You don't have to pay dues. You can if there's a Patreon. Involved. It's true. If you want. Also, as I sit here and record the show in a show shirt, yes. I'm wearing the merch. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we are in a sorority. I think we just yes, we are. Oh, we have. I feel so. I feel like I belong. We have welcome a symbol. all of you. We have a motto. Yeah. Should we have sort of Greek letters? <laughs> I say it's just numbers and it's 666. Oh, I was going to say 69420, but yes. Okay, yeah, also it could be that. (laughs) Multiple. Well, not wanting to worry Georgian's parents in the middle of the night, the house mother and roommate waited until dawn to call the police. You know they've got to 
kick themselves I think about that. In Ann Rule's book, she said they felt really bad yeah. about it because it was about three. Because the, the also, roommate waited until about three a.m. Yeah, and the roommate I mean, woke up the house mom at three a.m. and the house mom said, "Well, she may be because she was at her boyfriend's yeah, house." Yeah, that's what I'm saying. She's you might over. just think, "Oh, she just slept over there." Yeah. It's not crazy to think, oh, she wasn't home a few hours ago and she went to see her boyfriend. Maybe she just is sleeping over there. Or maybe she was studying and fell asleep or whatever. Yeah. Well, the next day, homicide detectives came out to explore the short, expansive alleyway in which Georgianne was abducted. But they found nothing. A neighbor would later say she heard a single sharp scream late at night, but that she chalked it up to college kids' horseplay. And what do you do? Like you said, you hear one single scream at three o'clock or midnight no. and you call. What are the cops going to say? Okay, yeah. we'll send somebody by then. I mean, he's already yeah, gone. He's gone. He just was, he really was just opportunistic. opportunity. Yep. If the opportunity knocked, he answered. The police went to the media and asked if anyone had seen anything along the stretch of Greek houses near campus. Three separate witnesses came forward describing a tall, handsome man with dark hair using crutches trying to carry a briefcase. They said he would struggle with the case, dropping it repeatedly. He had a pretty good act going. And I think this was when he had had the leg cast he made with cutting, and he cut his jeans up the front so you could see the cast from his jeans. And he would try to hold the briefcase in one hand and and it it would stumble and kick it. It was a production. It was a whole production. Stumble, kick it. Yeah. Oh, 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 no, no, no. I've got it. I've got it. This is why I don't help people. (sighs) See? Although I did hold the door for someone today that was pushing someone in a wheelchair. Yeah, that's so I can't be nice. That's true. You can't be nice. <laughs> I hit twice. But you were in, in public, and out. I held it. Well lit. I was in a doctor's office. <laughs> there you go. I think you're there safe. are people everywhere. So you're safe in a doctor's n- office. Not much was going to happen. Here's my question, though. So he had done the same thing a month before. It's at the same campus. Is word not getting around? I think that if was the issue. If you see a dude with the cast asking to do shit, d- you just heard, hopefully... That he, the same person was seen when this other girl went missing. Like, he was pretty good about ho- jurisdiction hopping. Yeah, but and this then after, was all in the same, pretty yeah, much the same it, territory. And after, uh, this was by this time was the summer. And after yeah. the first few months of it, then they started all talking to each other. But, you know, I just, I wonder if you just think this sh- just, it's not going to be me. Yeah, maybe that's it. And you always do I'm think just that. being paranoid. Yeah. It's not it's Again, not it plays me. to your sympathies. You're like, I don't want to be rude. Yeah. I don't want to be rude and not help this man. Even though I might feel like something isn't right and uncomfortable, I'm going to still do it because mm-hmm. I don't, my mom raised me differently. Yes. And and these are college students who presumably have, have been taught to have manners and yes. being respectful of elders or respectful of your co- you know colleagues yeah. and stuff. So I think I think he just it was opportunistic yeah. and he saw they're nice girls they'll be nice yeah, and yeah. then that's kind of what or he just waited for the one that was because people would women would turn him down all the time true he waited for the one that said okay true true one witness said she told the man she would help him after she came out of a nearby sorority house but spent a few minutes longer inside than she intended by the time she came back to help the man was gone my god that's How so close lucky. Was she to you that? get well. That's me. But go and saying I'll leave in five minutes, and then talking to somebody for thirty. I'm a I'm a bad leaver. Might have saved your life many times. You I'm a bad know. leaver. I think about that if I'm driving somewhere mm-hmm. and a wreck had just happened. Oh no, joke! And I think if I'd left five minutes earlier, you and I were I driving been in that wreck. We drove home from wine night, and that yeah. car. We watched that car spin out mm-hmm. and smash into the median. Inch, I mean, it was maybe 10 feet in yep. front of us. Yep. And, of course, I screamed, and Christy had to go, it's okay, it's okay, we're okay. We I get safe. strangely calm It was so nice because I was shrieking. Like <laughs> you go, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh God. and grab <laughs> my hand, which is a normal reaction to have. I don't – something, like – Zen comes over me in death defying situations. I was terrified. It's happened many times. So I don't know. Um, except for the time that I saw someone get into a wreck and get thrown out of their window on the 30 and had to get out in the middle of 30 and stand over his body while I called 911. That I was not calm. Not so much. Wasn't so calm when that happened. I God, think I was I mean... also pregnant. Well, Bundy later confessed to kidnapping George Ann, strangling her to death with a nylon stocking and then keeping her body for several days, performing odd rituals like shampooing her hair and applying makeup to her face. He was... That's... Escalating with what he was doing. Yeah, for sure. He also later admitted to committing necrophilia, 
and said he would often sleep with his victim's corpses in his bed for days or weeks until decomposition made it impossible. There's a lot of gross sentences in the whole world. That's one of the worst. Decomposition made it impossible. <laughs> it's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. He, they were his, his dolls. His, Dominion his, control yes, playthings. He would do all sorts of terrible things to them before he killed them and then continue those terrible things afterwards. Sleeping with a dead body in your bed for weeks and then going to work the next morning. Hey, Carol, how's it going? How did you watch the game last night? How did you sleep last night? Just complete disassociation mm-hmm. with what he's doing. And you know the whole time he's thinking about mm-hmm. that What's body waiting? back in his bed, what he gets to go home to. Ugh. That's ultimate control, though, and, and controlling the perception of his coworkers that they think yeah. he's a nice guy. Yep. That made it more fun for him, more yep. thrilling. Well, speaking of Carol, during the time Bundy was abducting and murdering these young women, he was also ironically working as the assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission, where he also wrote a pamphlet for women on rape prevention. Well, how nice of him. Yeah, and Car- uh, Anne Rule the author of The Stranger Beside Me, was writing a series of articles for a large newspaper in the area. And so she had done a lot of research on women who were victims of sexual Mm -hmm. assault. And as he was preparing this pamphlet, he said, oh, hey, I know you did research. Would you mind sending me some of that research and then things that you've done so I could use it for my pamphlet? Mm -hmm. And she said she ended up forgetting. And then later on, of course, when this all came out, she remembers him asking for that. Hey, can you send me the statistics and details that you've pulled from all these law enforcement (sighs) agencies? That's so, so bold. So snaky. So bold, too. He also worked at the Department of Emergency Services, a state government agency involved in the search for the missing women. So his hands were in all of this. And this is you see this common where they yep. want some role of authority and official capacity. And just inside information. Uh-huh. He knew what the police knew, what they didn't know, where they were searching, and not to mention the law and psychology background. Well, it's like Ed Kemper would just sit at the bar and talk yeah. to the cops and say, what do you think? Who do you think's doing this? Yeah. Wow, really? Yeah. Did you ever finish Mindhunter? Oh, I finished Mindhunter, and Great, I cannot wait. For, I can't believe I, tur- I stopped it after the first episode. We had this whole discussion about how much Jonathan Groff is just the hottest. He's very hot. But that I, I could not believe I had originally turned it off after the first episode. So good. Season two is coming out pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. A lot of good things are starting back up, just as a little tangent. Uh, Handmaid's Tale comes back next week, okay. or in like two weeks. You never watched that, did you? I have you? not. Oh, my God. it's It seems like such a bummer. Uh, it's it's upsetting, but in a very powerful and important way. It's also, oh, this last season is... Uh, Spot on for what's is, going on in here. It is pretty powerful. It's upsetting, but in the way that makes you want to go out and write your congressman or woman and just like stand up for change. It's in my humble opinion, the best and most important show on television. Wow. It's great. Elizabeth Moss is fantastic. Well, someone told me that Harry Potter was more important than the Bible and I read Harry Potter. So now you said Handmaid's Tale is the most <laughs> important go. show on television. I really think you, I, I mean, have to go and watch it. It's, it's great. You should, you should. And then you can be caught up before the next season starts. So it was at the Department of Emergency Services where Ted first met Carol Ann Boone, a divorced single mom who further down the road would play a critical role in his life. We'll get into her in the third episode. There's a lot. There's a lot. Good God. If you have watched the Zac Efron movie on Netflix, you know who she is. Correct. And, you know, the role that don't she want plays. to shame her. I just don't get it. I think she got wrapped up. We'll talk about it in the next episode, but I I have a lot of sympathy for her. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And Liz. Definitely Liz. During this time, Ted was also still dating Liz. Although depicted as a wonderful boyfriend in the Zac Efron Netflix movie, Ted was actually verbally abusive to Liz. And he burned a head in her fireplace. (laughs) Yeah. So let's not let the movie... He also did not respect her home. No. Anyway, whatsoever. Movie magic shows him as some nice guy. He was actually a shitbag. When Liz confronted him about the panties she found in his car, along, Not cool. along with the plaster of Paris used to make a cast like the ones the suspect was seen wearing, he threatened her. If you ever tell anyone about this, I'll break your fucking head. And then I'll burn it in the fireplace. I don't remember that scene in the Zac Efron movie. No. In fact, the only time he ever shows any 
emotion is at the very end, mm-hmm. spoiler, when they show the one, like, clip of him even attacking someone. Mm-hmm. They don't show any. And I, it's I don't like fault a flashback. It yeah, it's a flashback when she asks him at the end, I want to know what happened to this woman's head in this picture. Mm-hmm. And he just writes, hacksaw. Yeah. On the uh, glass in the jail cell. That part did give me chills. I was like, this part was good. I read an interview. Didn't make up for the rest of the movie. No, I read an interview with the director, and someone said, did that really happen? And the director said, well, it's a movie, so no. Yeah, no, I don't think that really happened. Great that was definitely, they took some liberties with that. Small digression on dumb, asking directors dumb questions. We went to the John Cusack Say Anything at the Majestic mm. Did Theater. they show the movie Yes, yeah, so we watched oh, Say Anything, nice. and then John Cusack came out. And there was a moderator from the University of Texas at Arlington that made me think of Chris Farley on Saturday Night Live when he would interview Paul McCartney and say, do you remember that time you were in the Beatles? Uh, yeah, that's so great. That was really Such cool. a great character. He, he just would say, do you remember how you were in High Fidelity? And John Such Cusack a movie. would say, yes. Why You said it in Chicago. Why did, why did you do that? And John Cusack said, well, I'm from Chicago. And I it related to it. And it was just the worst questions. And he goes... You. He was out of his element. A little bit. He was bit. scared. He, he was said, a little nervous. You uh, have been in movies. You've produced and written movies. Why haven't you directed one? And John Cusack goes, well, I've directed three movies. So I was like, did you not read the Wikipedia oh, page? Jesus Christ. It was so awkward and uncomfortable. But yours truly did get up. And I told him that uh, we have a podcast. I hope he listens. I, John, if you're listening. John Cusack, if you're listening. We love you so much. That's why I call you my boyfriend. I, I did tell him that. I have seen all of your movies multiple times. Yes. And we agree with you politically so please be friends yes, with we us. do yes we appreciate your twitter rants he was very concerned when i said it was a true crime podcast he said Where, why do you talk about me <laughs> I said, oh, uh, uh, nobody knows what i've done i haven't committed any crimes that you know of oh god i've said too much no he was very concerned uh that we but i just asked him about comedy and it turns out we have a lot of the same comedic influences as far as old snl old mm. sctv eugene levy dan Aykroyd. Yes, so oh, and he said oh, i used cons. to really love the gong show with chuck barris i'm sure you're too young Young, I said, actually, no, I love the gong show. Despite our third or 20 year age difference, does not mean anything. I love the same. It was on reruns. Stuff. Yeah. Oh, I love the gong show. I remember watching the gong show too. Uh, so it was a, overall, it was a very What's your good. favorite John Cusack movie? High Fidelity. Me too. Hot Tub Time Machine and High Fidelity. Oh, mine would probably be High Fidelity and. What's the one where they're in the motel? 1408. No, the other one. Identity. Yes. I am a John Cusack IMDb. Uh, I I identity. I've seen really both good. of those two. 1408 I didn't love. 1408 scared me so bad and still uh, makes I me scared. I didn't find it scary. He actually said um, that people ask him to do screenings of it, but he said, I didn't really think a lot of people loved it, but I, the person I was with, Gypsy, my friend Gypsy is a horror fanatic, and mm-hmm. she said that's one of her favorites. Interesting. Yeah. I found Identity much scarier Identity is very scary. Yeah. It's suspenseful, I guess. They're, and they're scary hot tub time machine is so yeah, good. Yeah, hot tub time machine. Underrated great. movie. It's very good. Well, another time, Liz found that Ted had been stealing small items and electronics. That's true. He didn't have a real great job, and he would show up with televisions and radios and stuff. But he would just yeah, pawn or pick. No, I guess you don't pickpocket a TV but unless yeah. you got a giant pocket. <laughs> very big pants <laughs> for that TV. Well, she confronted him, and again, he threatened her, saying, If you tell anyone, I'll break your fucking neck. Again, not as yeah, that <laughs> He's definitely emotionally abusive and verbally abusive, but none of this was shown. In the Zac Efron, he just seemed like a nice... Which, honestly, was kind of... it While watching that, he was portrayed as such this nice guy to her, that when he was in his trials and stuff, and she would just be glued to the TV and, and heartbroken... I found like there was kind of a disconnect that why is she so tore up about this? Because they didn't seem like... When Sean Astin is right there with his arm around you. Oh, man. No, it wasn't Sean Astin. It was Macaulay Culkin's brother. Oh, I thought it was Sean... Who, 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 is he in that movie? Sean Astin? No. Who is the guy that plays the boyfriend? Is it... Oh, that's uh, Macaulay Haley Joel... Culkin. Haley, Haley Joel Osment. That's what I'm thinking of. So not Macaulay Culkin's no. brother. No. Haley Joel Osment, because I remember... So we were both completely wrong. I remember watching it and thinking, who is that? It's the sixth And then it came to me, and then I thought, well, and he was also in uh, uh, the most recent season of Silicon Valley, which is why I was like, I had seen him recently. Did you watch Silicon Valley? Uh, I've only watched the first season. Great. Well, he's in the most recent season of them. Well, reports of the six missing girls were splashed across headlines and on every major news channel throughout Washington and Oregon. 
Citizens of the Pacific Northwest were in a full-blown panic. Young women stopped hitchhiking and started walking in groups at night. That is just safe practice. True. The- also, just don't hitchhike ever for any no. reason. Ironically, he had passed a law to help make it more legal and accessible, yes. and then his actions <laughs> caused a took dip advantage. in the numbers. Well, he took advantage of yep. it. The pressure was mounting for law enforcement to find this man and put an end to the nightmare. Unfortunately, police had little to no evidence to go on. Bundy was smart and knew how not to leave any evidence behind. There were never any fingerprints or eyewitnesses of the actual crimes. And what little information the police did have, they kept from reporters for fear of compromising the investigation. There is a There was a such... A desperate want for something to hold on to mm-hmm. that Ann Rule talks about a psychic friend of hers volunteered that the abductions were happening when the Libra moon was in Taurus mm-hmm. or something like that and she said at the, right around this time there was a meeting of law enforcement and Ann went to it and the psychic had given Ann an envelope that had a piece of paper in it with something written on it that was sealed and Ann didn't know what it said and she gave it to the sergeant and he said what am I going to do with this and she mm-hmm. said honestly it's astrology believe it or don't believe it you know you tell me and he took it and it said like she said don't open this till the second week of July he waited in the second week of July it said the next murders will occur the 13th through the 15th because really? that's when this moon was going to be in Taurus yeah interesting also on the Ted Bundy tapes they talk about going to one of the detectives goes to visit a detective at another precinct and he walks in and all over you know you just have the the war room with basically a scene from true detective with just strings everywhere Mm -hmm. and pictures up and he had all of these dates and he was like what is this he's like there he's like 16 days between victims 26 Mm -hmm. days between victims 16 days 26 and they were the same numbers Mm -hmm. and they were cross comparing them to satanic cults in the area yeah and other like types of witchcraft because they thought that it it had something to do with sacrifices and like rituals that were happening something like that this woman the the astrologer just said whoever the perpetrator is is somehow is drawn subconsciously consciously or subconsciously to this this time it, the yeah. the tides change and it puts you in a mood very interesting yeah. that is true i mean the, the moon affects a ton well up until this point bundy had attacked all his victims late at night protected by the shadows but by mid-july his confidence that he couldn't be caught had grown and he abducted his next two victims in broad daylight. On July 14, 1974, at Lake Sammamish, a state park just east of Seattle, Ted kidnapped and murdered two women, a 23-year-old probation caseworker from King County, Janice Ott, and Denise Marie Naslin, a 19-year-old college student majoring in computer programming. Janice Ott was married. Her husband was off studying in, he was studying cre- how to create prosthetic limbs oh. in Bakersfield, California. So they were pretty far away mm-hmm. and they were, would call each other every night and write each other letters. And a few days before that, she had said, she had mentioned to him, man, these letters take so long. You know, somebody could be dead before they got this. Mm. And he had written in the last letter he wrote to her for some reason. He said he had no idea why he wrote it, but it said, be careful take care of yourself out there and then this is gosh and this there were tens of thousands of people at this lake at any given time it was popular the the summer it there were all sorts of lake activities people went with their families on picnics there was a ton of people around and this was in the middle of the day Mm -hmm. this was how bold he'd become yep around noon there were multiple witnesses who later came forward claiming a handsome dark-haired man introducing himself as ted so bold asked for help didn't even try and come up with something fake he should have just said he was debt (laughs) ted backwards oh yeah well this time he was unloading a sailboat from his tan colored volkswagen beetle one difference from the earlier crimes this suspect spoke with a light accent perhaps canadian or british one witness had gone so far as to follow the suspect to his vehicle but when she saw there was no sailboat she ran because I think by this point people know what the the jig is up. They know the mo. They know the. I would just assume anyone thing. with a beetle was a monster. Yeah, <laughs> all forty two thousand owners. <laughs> Everyone. The the uh, Canadian slash British accent. Mm-hmm. You think it was intentional or just an arrogant 
affect he had. I think he was. It was intentional. Yeah, people trying to throw trust people, people off. And you, and you, he sounds you're very more proper. likely to trust someone that mm-hmm. sounds very proper and, and British. British people have lovely accents. If someone is talking to me in a British accent, I immediately like them more than if they don't have a British. That's accent. why my Siri is set with a British accent. You're what? Oh, is my she? Siri. It's a man. Oh, it makes me think of Jarvis. <laughs> Well, two witnesses actually saw Janice Ott leave with a suspect in his VW Beetle after listening to his sailboat story. He had a pretty good story for her, and there was a person who overheard it, and he said, I just need to load it, but it's actually at my parents' house up the hill in XYZ Village, and she was familiar with the village, and he was so familiar with the area, he really could come off as natural and being from there. Could you just help me with my sailboat? It's right. I mean, it's 10 minutes away. I'm so sorry to intrude. And her husband was out of town. She went to just hang out. She had anything else to do. And, man. Golly. He knew what he was doing. There's so many questions I would have. Why don't you have someone at your parents' house load it for you? Why are you here if you don't have your sailboat? You're you're speaking from a 2019 cynicism that did not exist in the 70s. I guess I did. I guess I am, yeah. About four hours later, Denise Nasland left her friends at a picnic to go to the restroom. She never returned. Bundy later told Stephen McCod, the interviewer in the Bundy tapes, that he took Denise to where he was holding Janice and reportedly killed one while the other watched. However, in a later interview on the eve of his execution, he denied that this happened. Again, it's just how he feels at the time. Who really even knows what the truth is? Timing-wise, Janice was abducted around noon, and Denise was abducted around 4, 4.30 p.m. So he. So you think that he did make one watch, or that I think he did. Janice was already dead. They, was, there was reports, his defense, his defense lawyer, before he was fired which is a whole other thing, said that as a child, it was Bundy confessed to taking mice, and I think we talked about yeah. this in the last episode, and torturing one while the other ones watched and deciding which one lived and which one didn't. So I think there was he just did because it. Because of people. all the ones we know of, this is the only incident where he had two victims in the same day that were connected, Yeah, that he had meat. So maybe it was just experimenting seeing, seeing testing his bound- i mean he was already in the daylight he's getting bolder he's escalating it's interesting though that there were no additional reports of him doing things like this but mm-hmm. also we know a fraction of the women that he actually True. murdered so and it very likely could have happened again the brazenness i think is becomes problematic yeah that's true Well, with sufficient witnesses to these new abductions, police could finally get a decent composite sketch of the suspect. Not to mention, he had used the name Ted to introduce himself. Police added the name Ted to the bottom of the sketch and began circulating it throughout the Seattle area. About like when Pam sketches Dwight as the slasher. (laughs) And it's just, I mean, the the sketch looked like him and had his name under it. And they knew the car that he was driving. It's just getting, the walls are starting to close in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, detectives began receiving a huge number of tips, sometimes up to 200 per day, from citizens claiming they knew who Ted was. And these tips were not just from random strangers. Anne Rule, Ted's former co-worker at the Crisis Hotline and author of his biography, The Stranger Beside Me, recognized the sketch in the description of the car and reported Bundy as a possible suspect. Mike, do you think when she saw that, all the things started to fall into place, or do you think... It was just, oh, my God, I can't even I can't believe this. I wonder. She said she got a weird feeling because he had written her a Christmas card because I think we said it in the last episode that he was her date to a Christmas party where he got real hammered and she drove him and she drove him home and he had written her a card the next day or, you know, the next week that said something to the effect of it was an old poem and it said the woman with the long hair gave up her hair for her husband and the husband gave up his thing for a comb for her long hair but it was some reference in this old timey poem to long hair and she said when the the sketch the name the car and the victims mm-hmm. all had this long hair she said it just sort of all coalesced and made her feel kind of antsy i ask because unless you kind of had a suspicion or someone gave you the creeps you wouldn't just immediately think, "Oh, this is them." It could be him. I would, I would think, "Oh, yeah, they that looks like Tommy," but there's no way that's Tommy. Mm-hmm. Tommy's not capable of something like that. But if I thought, if I'd always had a weird feeling mm-hmm. about my friend, and then I see this, and then it all starts to click together. Oh gosh. 
One of Bundy's other co-workers at the Department of Emergency Services, as well as one of his former professors at the University of Washington, also called in to report him, saying the description and car both matched Ted. On August 8, 1974, Liz Klepfer, Bundy's longtime girlfriend, discovered a hatchet under the seat of Ted's car, a bag of women's clothes, a bowl of house keys, crutches, bandages, and plaster of Paris among Ted's belongings. That is just such damning evidence. <laughs> that is nothing you ever want to find in your boyfriend's closet. She knew that all these items had been used by the suspect called Ted. She also knew that the composite sketch resembled her boyfriend. Nervous and terrified, Liz called the Seattle Police Department, but was essentially dismissed. The officer told her, You uh, need to come in and fill out a report. We're uh, too busy to talk to girlfriends over the phone. <laughs> They said that they got so many girlfriends calling the police saying, I think it's my boyfriend, which in itself is very upsetting. That's horrifying. How many girlfriends think, Here's the thing. I think my boyfriend's capable of something ladies, like this? Ladies, what did we say last time? You got to love yourself and you're going to get a great date. If at any reason you look at the person that you're in a relationship with and think, eh, I can see him being a serial killer, shut it down. Shut End it down it. immediately. There's a million. Get out. There's a million fish in the sea that aren't serial killers. That are not possible serial yeah. killers. Yeah, get out. If you feel that weird thing go off, that red flag, trust your gut. Trust your gut. Did you know? I think I've said before when people are about to do something evil, they emit a certain scent. <gasps> That is kind of like subconsciously detected. And that's why if you get in an elevator and somebody's and weird. somebody's and somebody say you get on an elevator and there's just a weird man on it and you that automatically have that feeling that happened today. Well, get off because you might be Luckily, your gut is telling you he is emitting this this uh, pheromone because he's about to hurt you. The monster stink. Yes. Oh, God. Called, yeah. That's, if you can have I'm write that screenplay, <laughs> it's called monster stink. <laughs> If you can train a squirrel to warn you before you have a seizure, yeah, why can't we train dogs or squirrels or something to warn us for the the monster stink? Well, you might be able to. I don't know. It, that would be a hard thing to test because you'd have to find a man who's about to that do was about to kill someone and get the stink, and then trap that somehow. Man, yeah, not a lot of studies are done. Does it? Do like you know that. what it smells like, or no? I don't think you. It's not something you actually smell. It's subconscious. Yes, it's just a pheromone that's released. Oh God! It's like when you're attracted to someone, like it's, or you're not attracted to them. It's because yeah. your pheromones don't match up. True. Between August to December, Liz would report Ted to the police three times, all the while continuing to date him. Oh boy, girl. <sighs> I mean, I wonder. I don't. I, I'm not going to victim blame. No, not at all. And he was verbally abusive to her. Yeah. So I'm sure she was. I mean, if someone says, "I'll fucking break your neck if you tell anybody," yeah. what are you going to break up with he him? He was also gone so much. True. Though, that it was not that, a, that makes it any easier. It might have actually made it better because she didn't have to be around him, his dumbass all the time. It's a long distance relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Police had narrowed the list of potential offenders down to a hundred now, and Ted Bundy was a prime suspect. Detectives even learned Ted had been at Lake Sammamish two days before the kidnappings. But when authorities showed Ted's picture to eight witnesses who had been at Lake Sammamish on the day of the murders, seven definitively said it wasn't the same guy. Our, Our witnesses, memories are trash. Our witnesses are trash. Our memories are trash. Do not listen. Don't buy into any of that. There's so much more evidence than these eight or seven idiots. There's that, so many eyewitnesses in these exoneration cases that I look at work and you're just like, don't listen no. to our witnesses. Police now felt they were at another roadblock. Many also felt that a clean cut law student with no known criminal record couldn't possibly be responsible for such heinous crimes. A month later, on September 6th, the skeletal remains of Janice Ott and Denise Naslin were discovered near a service road two miles east of Lake Sammamish State Park. Additional bones were also found at the site and were later identified by Bundy as George Ann Hawkins. Six months later, a group of forestry students marking trees on Taylor Mountain discovered the skull of Brenda Ball. When police searched the surrounding area, they discovered the skulls and mandibles of the rest of Bundy's victims, except for Donna Manson, whose remains were never found. It's tough for those students. 
Oh, yeah. Not what I'm you telling imagined. telling you, I think it's David Tell has a bit about that's why he didn't go hiking or doing this. He doesn't want to be You the never one to find, find a him. body sitting on your couch. Yeah, it's, all, it's like you're true. hiking through a forest or something. Mm-hmm. During this murderous rampage, Bundy had been attending law school at the University of Puget Sound. In August of 1974, he made the decision to transfer to the University of Utah Law School in Salt Lake City and began taking first-year law school classes all over again. However, Ted found the classes difficult and, quote, completely incomprehensible. Is that how you felt? I wouldn't say incomprehensible. <laughs> completely incomprehensible? No. I don't think you would have graduated if that's how you felt. No, no. I think he, he was in over his head. He really bolstered himself a lot in yeah. the a- application process for Utah and made himself seem a lot better than he was. Mm-hmm. And much like Dr. Christopher Dunch, Dr. Death in the Dallas case, mm-hmm. People say, how did this guy who was a trash physician ever get this residency? All of these letters of recommendation from professors. So writers of letters of recommendation, I'm going to tell you right now, do not, you're not doing anybody any favors. Do your due diligence. Well, don't, these were professors that had him and they just want to get rid of him. Yeah. It's like, do not write letters that you don't mean. Right. Good point. Because then you could create Ted Bundy or Christopher Dunch. So <laughs> think about what you're doing out Someone there. Someone did. Well, Bundy now had a completely new hunting ground and wasted little time starting his killing spree back up. On September 2nd, 1974, Ted picked up a hitchhiker in Idaho who has never been identified. He raped and strangled the woman, then returned the next day to photograph and dismember the corpse. On October 2nd, 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox disappeared from a suburb outside of Salt Lake City. Ted later admitted that he dragged her into a wooded area, intending only to rape and let her go. However, in an effort to muffle her screams, he claims he accidentally strangled her. Although Ted claimed to have buried her near a national park in south-central Utah, her remains were never found. He says in the Bundy tapes, he was trying to de-escalate. He was trying to... See if he could control it. See if he can control this rage and these urges within him. And just rape. He was like, maybe if I just get this out, then I won't need to do the killing. And and, uh, clearly, I don't think he accidentally strangled her. Oh, no, not at all. October 18th, 17-year-old Melissa Smith, the daughter of the town's police chief, also went missing from a suburb near Salt Lake City. The police searched for Melissa for nine days until eventually discovering her naked body in the mountains near the town. She had been beaten, raped, sodomized, and strangled with a nylon stocking. The medical examiner also determined that she had remained alive for up to seven days after being abducted. I think he really enjoyed this mountainous terrain around Mm -hmm. him because he could really take people out, hide them. Where do you think he has her for seven days? In this mountain area. You think just out in the woods or at his house? Maybe. That's true. Maybe at like an apartment or something. I think out in the mountains, there's too much room for error. True. And she can get away while you're not there with Yeah, her. unless he's spending the night out there, which I don't think is happening. No, and they said up to seven days. So that doesn't necessarily mean yeah. seven full days, but yeah. This one, of the one, of all of them, they're all upsetting. This one gets to me the most because imagine being alive for a week and just tortured. being tortured. And thinking that your dad's the police chief yeah. and having that hope and yep. not, man, yep. never being rescued. On Halloween night. Ted sexually assaulted Laura Aim, a 17-year-old leaving a cafe in the suburb of Lehigh. Like Melissa Smith, Laura had also been beaten, raped, sodomized, and strangled with an nylon stocking. So this is what he was doing to all of his victims. Pretty much in, yes. in Utah. And then a lot of times keeping their bodies afterwards and continuing to do these things. And then when it was the decomposition has taken a hold. He would go dump them in the woods. Find them a place in the mountains, yeah. The remains of two female bodies were later found who had also died in 1974, 18-year-old Carol Valenzuela and an unidentified female. Both deaths were attributed to Ted, although he never confessed. There's a lot of cases where they found bodies around this area or on the road between Seattle and Utah when he was Mm -hmm. going back and forth that he never confessed to, but MO style, they think it was him. Yeah, that's like Gacy. Yeah. Of all of Bundy's victims... Carol DeRanch is the only woman that managed to escape. On the Friday evening of November 8, 1974, Carol was shopping at the mall when a man claiming to be a police officer approached her. He told her someone had tried to break into her car in the parking lot and that she needed to come with him to make sure nothing was missing. 
this is a 70s man. I mean, and again, and who, he's he's pr- he is pretending to be a police officer. Who will you go with? Yeah. On the Ted Bundy tapes, they interview Carol, and she tells this whole story. Mm-hmm. It is wild. Carol accompanied the man to her car and quickly saw nothing was amiss. She said she became uneasy when the man kept urging her to get in the car to get a closer look and then asked to see his identification. The man produced a badge, and Carol accepted this as proof of him being an officer. The alleged officer then told Carol that they were holding the suspect at the jail and said she needed to come with him to press charges. Carol saw that he was not driving a police cruiser, but chalked it up to him being undercover. Never do that. No. There's so many things where her gut is telling her, Mm -hmm. this isn't right, this isn't right, but he is being persuasive, he's being insistent, and a bully, and breaks her down. She got in the car with him, and he proceeded to drive off. When Carol realized they were not headed to the police station, she questioned the man. He immediately pulled over to the side of the road, grabbed her, and told her if she screamed, he would blow her head off. He then handcuffed her, but in their struggle, only managed to handcuff one of her wrists. Carol saw her opportunity, flung open the door, and took off running. Bundy attacked her and tried to hit her with a crowbar, but she managed to escape. When she saw a car approaching, she ran to it, flung open the door, dove inside, and screamed for the driver to take her to the police station. Months later, Carol's report would help to finally put Ted Bundy behind bars. Can you imagine being that driver? Good God. You just see this woman. She said she was hysterical. I'm sure. And she just, and it was the driver's side door. She opened and just dove on top of this person and was just Scream. screaming. Yeah. And I think, you know, we were saying don't hitchhike or whatever. If someone jumps in your car and isn't like, take me to the woods to a cabin. They're like, take me to the police you, you immediately. You can tell that this was a, a weeping, not fake. Yes. This is it, in Chicago and there was a girl crying on the side of the road. You just know. I mean, I looked at yeah. her and I was like, okay? And she just said, call the police. You know, it's not someone that says, come to my car with yeah, me. Yeah. You know, it's somebody that immediately wants to get the authorities involved. That's a little bit of a lesser, oh, sure. dangerous situation. Definitely. While Carol managed to get away, Ted would not be deterred. Just a few hours after Carol managed to escape, Ted abducted and murdered Debbie Kent, a high schooler. She was leaving her brother's... She was leaving a high school play to pick up her brother... Just walk to her park- to the car in the parking lot. I mean, think about how many times you walked from your high school auditorium to the parking lot where you A million parked. times. Yeah. Millions of times. And they said later that the theater teacher had seen Ted pacing in the back of the auditorium. And he asked a few other people, hey, can you come out and check out this car in the parking lot? It's still posing as this authority figure. Well, then when the cops, when Debbie Kent goes missing and the cops go to the high school in the parking lot... They find a key to handcuffs, and it was to the handcuffs that were on Carol Durant. So they wrist. knew. So this is when things all started to come mm-hmm. together. Reading about all the latest abductions that were happening near Ted's new home in Utah, Liz once again called police to report her suspicions. This time, she was taken more seriously and interviewed in detail. Ted was now considered a serious person of interest. But because there was no credible forensic evidence linking him to the Utah crimes and credible witnesses from Lake Sammamish said the picture they were shown was not the man they saw that day, police couldn't do much. Disregard the eyewitnesses. I know. In December, Liz would call the police again to report her boyfriend. And the next month, he would come stay with her in Seattle for a week. Completely unaware, his girlfriend was confident. He was the monster behind these vicious murders. And in the movie, though, it's, she seems to still believe in him up and towards the end. But in real life, she was calling. She was calling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They only show in the movie her call once. Yeah, but she, she did multiple times. And she called in November and then again in December. Yeah. She's trying to... And when, she, she said in the movie she felt really guilty that maybe if she had done something sooner she could have saved i mean some and of none girls. of this was her fault oh hell no but i think she would she was calling more than was let on in the zach efron movie for sure least. but yeah. man can you imagine no i can't imagine having known i called the police three times because i think my boyfriend is a serial killer and then he's staying with me in my apartment for a week where we're probably intimate and she yes. was also then making plans to go See him in a few weeks back in Utah. It's tough. So you wonder, 
did she have these suspicions and she felt like if I don't report them, I'm going to feel guilty in case it is him. But there's just no way it could be him. Or does she really think it is and she's keeping up appearances to maintain some normalcy so he doesn't get wind of what's really going on? I think it's maybe the second one. And I think she thinks if I break up with him, this person who the last mention of what are, what are you doing with these people? house keys and women's underwear Mm -hmm. and he says i will kill you yeah what you can we can break up with him yeah he's threatened you and in your head if you think he's willing to go snatch somebody off the street and do unspeakably horrible things when i break up with him what's he gonna do to me and my child yeah the child has a whole i think she had to keep up appearances because she was didn't even feel threatened was actually threatened multiple times by a person who she credibly thought could be this violent monster we were actually sent in the in the last episode, we talked about how she wrote a book. It's unavailable on uh, – it's out of print now. You can buy it for like $500 on Amazon. But we had three listeners message us with PDFs of this book. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Have you read it yet? I have not had a chance to read it. I have not either. I'm going to, though, because I'd like to hear how she felt. Definitely. I think she probably still did have some feelings for him. I think so. Yeah. So thank you, Raina Luhan – or Luhan, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, and Aaron Brown, a.k.a. at Handsome Boy Charlie Brown on Instagram, for sending us these books. We very much appreciate yes. it. Yes. So what do we think? Man, I just, I think, I'm glad we separated it as we did, because I think it's important, you know, that we give the victims their due. And yeah. like we said, at no point was anybody doing anything except for being nice. Yeah, for sure. And le- and trying to help There's the still more victims, too. We're going to get into... The Florida State sorority Correct. murders in the next one, as well as some other ones, and his arrest and trials. Correct. So that's going to be the whole next episode. So yeah, keep an eye out for yeah. that. Yeah. As far as what I think, I think he's maintaining his shitbag status. Correct. And I agree that he is just an opportunity killer. Correct. He would, like you said, he gets turned down by one. He'll just go find yeah, the next yeah. one. Unfortunately, there wasn't. He wasn't stalking these women, and it wasn't, he wasn't it didn't, seeking them out specifically. It was any woman that happened to be there. When Carol got away, he just drove to a yeah, high school. That's a perfect example. He didn't care if he killed Carol. He just wanted to kill somebody someone. that night. He yep. just wanted to rape and kill someone that night. And gosh, how upsetting to be Debbie Kent's parents. So sad because. Of course, you don't want to say, oh, I wish that he would have gotten Carol the other had, one had been murdered. But had she, Debbie probably would have still been alive. It's wild to one, think about that. 99 percent. Yeah. It's the whole butterfly effect we mm-hmm. talked about last time. You change one thing. But then, you know, then Carol's family it, on the flip side is so ecstatic that and she managed to get away. She was really instrumental in helping describe what happened and describe him yes. and pointing him out, which we'll go over yeah. in the next one, that it's. You know, is it lucky that she survived? You know, I mean, yeah. obviously it is it's for her that she survived. So I don't know. It's just but hard. also for others because she, I mean, it eventually helped put him behind bars. Definitely. So. so it's hard. It's hard to it really is. extrapolate. You know, you can't trade one life for the other. Yeah, definitely. It's probably definitely hard for those families to come to grips with that. So. Well, next week we'll wrap this up and talk about the trials and arrest and his execution. That's right. Spoiler alert. He gets fried. Yes. <laughs> Well, many of you have asked if we have a Patreon where you can donate to the show. We do. Our show will always remain free, but if you wish to donate to help offset the cost of making and hosting the show, you can visit Sinisterhood.com, and there's a little Patreon button up at the top. You can get some sweet perks like Patreon-exclusive content, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group, a special shout-out on the show, and a monthly bonus mini-sode. That's right. You mentioned you're wearing your shirt. I'm wearing Where mine. can someone get one of those sweet-ass shirts? Go to Sinisterhood.com and click shop in the top right corner. Mm-hmm. I am wearing the Heather Navy. T- Not Heather because it's her. The every color shirt, is Heather. Every shirt I wear is a Heather shirt. But this one is Heathered Navy, so it's a little bit of a gray navy. Yes. That says, keep it creepy on the front. And it says, the devil rules the airways on the back. And yes, I'm wearing the shirt of the band I'm in, so <laughs> I'm not even ashamed. But head to Sinisterhood.com and there's a button in the top that says shop. You can get mugs, 
hats, beanies, all sorts of fun totes, stuff. People baby. have been ordering and they're all starting to get their orders now and people have been tagging us on Instagram photos and it's so exciting to see you guys in our swag. I love it. You look great. All yes, of you. Totally. Well, the best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast and tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means a lot to us and it really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. We also appreciate when you take your friend's phone and forcibly subscribe them right in front of them. Mm-hmm. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at on the internet? I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on Twitter at Christy or GTFO. Heather, what about you? You can find me on that World Wide Web at Heather VS The World on Instagram or MCK VS The World on Twitter. Make sure you stick around after our sign off for the Patreon shout outs. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, you guys, we have some special Patreon shout outs. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Here we go. Jane McNamara. Morgan Southern. What's up? Is that the Morgan? The Morgan of Stage Right Podcast yes. slash of the North Texas Performing Arts. Brilliant director. Slash of Caesar Via and Morgan. Yes. Slash our friend from the 1995 Chicago Bulls, a fellow comedian, <laughs> Caesar Via's beautiful girlfriend and a dear friend of mine. She and I text back and forth about old country music. Oh, <laughs> I love that. She's great. McKenna Mat- Matal. Claire Genevieve LaFleur. Lala. Beautiful name. Kim. Jennifer Wright. Heather Stone. Shout out, Heather. And Rachel Rocket, which is the greatest name. That is a very time. fun name. I feel like you are a superhero. I you're all it. superheroes because you're our dear patrons. Thank you so much for supporting the show. We could not do it without you. And we look forward to sharing with our, with you our bonus mini this month. Yes. Keep it creepy. <laughs> Say-